Well, this week, my wife, Leah, is 35 weeks pregnant, which means that we are almost at the finish line. It's crazy. Now, word of advice, uh, just don't ask her if she's sleeping comfortably throughout the night unless you want a chair thrown your way. Uh, <laughs> now, I'm kidding. She is handling uh, the discomforts of pregnancy super, super well. Um, and one of the things that comes with pregnancy is a variety of cravings, right? And so this go around of pregnancy, she's craving all the sweet things, specifically ice cream. And so <clears throat> recently she told me that she had a random craving for a Wendy's Frosty. And so she went to the nearest Wendy's and when she pulled up there, they told her that the machine was out of order. And so she was so disappointed. And you can't get a pregnant woman angry, am I right? And so as her husband, you know, I always want to make sure she's happy. And so to ensure that we can get Frosties on command in the future, we are now proud owners of a franchise of Wendy's now. So, no, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> we bought the whole thing, right? Uh, no, I, but I'm pretty sure Leah was contemplating on buying it and owning one at that point. But it's clear that her cravings are being heightened as a direct result of her pregnancy, right? Now, I bring this up this morning because today we're going to be looking at a Bible passage that describes every human's universal search for something to satisfy the cravings that our souls seek after. And so similarly to Leah's pregnancy, which has heightened some cravings and desires she has, we're going to see how the psalmist David's difficult situation here, his circumstance here in this passage, is going to heighten some cravings and desires that he has in this life as well. And so this morning, we're going to continue our summer sermon series in the Psalms. And so today, we're going to be specifically in Psalm chapter 63. So you can open up your Bibles there. Now, Psalm chapter 63. Now, in the heading of this Psalm, you're going to notice that David wrote it when he was in the wilderness of Judah. Now, when did this happen specifically, right? Well, a few weeks back, we talked about how uh, David encountered and experienced a ton of relational conflict and betrayal in his lifetime. Well, one of those instances is the story that we find in 2 Samuel chapter 15, when uh, David's friend and counselor Ahithophel uh, betrayed David. He betrayed David, and he helped Absalom, which was David's son, lead a revolt to overthrow David as king. And so the story says that he went, David went into the wilderness. And so he was on the run because his life was in danger, but so was his kingdom. But after being on the run, while being on the run in the wilderness, and, then, and probably not having all the resources he normally would have as king of Israel, right? You would think he would want to fulfill his most simple and basic human need of like finding food or drink, right? But he doesn't. Instead, he sits down and he writes this psalm. And in this psalm, he expresses that not only his body, but his soul longs for something much greater, something much deeper than what food and drink can, can satisfy and provide for. And so there's only one thing that can satisfy this craving that he has. And so this long-lasting satisfaction that his soul seeks after becomes the main theme of this psalm. And so this is a little bit of the context going on here in this psalm today. And so here's the main thing that I want you to remember today. Here's our main idea that I want you to remember, remember and we're going to be breaking down. It's this, that since only God can satisfy our greatest longings, we can have true contentment in life. Since only God, only him, can satisfy our greatest longings, we can have true contentment in life. So now that you're in uh, Psalm chapter 63, let's read what verse 1 says. Let's read verse 1. <clears throat> It says, verse one says, God, you are my God. I eagerly seek you. I thirst for you. My body faints for you in a land that is dry and desolate and without water. Now, as we said before, David was in a literal wilderness fleeing from danger. And he describes this land as a land that is dry, desolate, and without water. Now, usually you and I don't normally end up going into a wilderness often in life. At least I don't. I'm an avid indoorsman, not outdoorsman, 
endorsement, uh, but we normally go into a spiritual wilderness uh, like the one described here, where our lives are dry and desolate, right? In another psalm, David compares his soul to being parched like a wilderness. And so there is a spiritual wilderness that all of us go through at some point in life. And so this spiritual wilderness is where we face our, our greatest troubles, our greatest fears, danger, isolation, suffering, pain, and so forth. And usually, this is where our cravings are heightened for something much deeper. And so the wilderness is usually the place where we crave and where we long for, uh, for a deeper sense of meaning, purpose, identity, and belonging in life. But as he writes this psalm in the wilderness, we see that he is not in need. He's completely satisfied. He's completely content. And from David's perspective, he's already found what satisfies his greatest longings. And he says it's better than life itself. You know what it is? It's God. It's God. And so he starts off Psalm 63 with a powerful statement, which everything else flows from that. He says, God, you are my God. And he's not just addressing any God here. He's addressing the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and Jacob. This is the God he serves, and this is the God that satisfies. And the fact that he addresses our God specifically is very important. And the reason is, is because there are several different counterfeit gods that promise to satisfy our greatest longings in life. And these counterfeit gods can be power, fame, money, sex, and so forth. These things can't truly satisfy us, nor give us long-lasting contentment in life. And it's only a matter of time till we realize that they'll fail us, that they'll disappoint us, that they'll turn into busts. Now, many of you know my love for football and the NFL draft, and I love keeping up with players' careers in the pros to see if they've lived up to the hype or not. Well, For example, I know there are many players that have been drafted by the Philadelphia Eagles that have turned into really good players. And then there's many of them that have not turned into good players. They've actually turned into busts. Now, this is the term that many in the NFL use to describe um, people that are drafted really high up in the draft, right, and that have a lot of potential, have a lot of hype behind them, but then their careers end up being major disappointments and failures, right? Now, if the team knew that they'd turn into bust, they, you know, they wouldn't have been drafted at all. But the team doesn't know that they're bust until after they've invested high draft capital to get them, but also a lot of time and energy on these players. Now, my team in Washington has never drafted a bust ever. I know, I'm kidding. I can't even say that with a straight face. Of course, that's our motto. That's all we do. We draft busts. That's all we do. But similarly to these players that are drafted high, I think these uh, counterfeit gods, they they present themselves with high potential. High potential. And and, and like they are going to uh, satisfy our greatest longings in life. They have a lot of hype behind them, right? And so we invest a lot of time, energy, and money in them. But it's only a matter of time till we realize that they will fail us. They will disappoint us. And they will turn into busts. And so my prayer today is that all of us, like David, would see how great the one and only true God is, that there is no God beside him. There is none like him. Only he can satisfy, and only he can bring true contentment in life. All other uh, counterfeit gods will fail to satisfy, but the God of the Bible, the God of Israel, our God, will never fail. And then verse 1 continues saying, I eagerly seek you, I thirst for you, I my body faints for you. See, we are all in search of and trying to seek out what can truly satisfy our soul. And so there's a lot of things that promise us, all these counterfeit gods, right? And so this is what the American dream promises us. This is what uh, politics promise us. This is what hookup culture promises. This is what climbing up the corporate ladder promises. And so what are you seeking to satisfy you? What are you spiritually hungry for? What are you spiritually thirsting for? Now, you may think on the surface that on the surface, you just want that immediate need and desire being satisfied, but it's always much deeper than that. 
Do you know that behind every desire for satisfaction is a desire for God himself? Behind every desire for satisfaction, if you peel back enough layers, you'll see that it's God that you're seeking after. Because only he can provide what our souls seek after. And so the real question isn't just what are you seeking to satisfy, it's this. Do we want God more than we want anyone or anything or anything else in this world? Do we want God more than we want anyone or anything else in this world? The psalm is proof that God is all that we seek after, and only he can provide what we truly want and need in this life. And when we realize that, everything else in this world fails in comparison to his glory. So what does a satisfied and content life look like then? What does it look like then? Well, the rest of this psalm explains and describes what it looks like. It describes what it looks like. Now, this is not an exhaustive list, but it's what we see in our text today. And so the first thing we see here is that a content life is a focused life. A content life is a focused life. So let's open up uh, to verse 2. Let's keep on reading uh, Psalm 63, verse 2. Look what it says. It says, so I gaze on you in the sanctuary to see your strength and your glory. So David says, I gaze on you. To gaze means to have your eyes fixed on something. It means that your eyes are, are looking at and focused on one sole thing. And what he says here is that his eyes are focused on God in his sanctuary. But you have to remember, there is no physical sanctuary or temple in the wilderness right now, right? And so he's referring to a past event when he could physically go to the wilderness to worship God. So you can say what he's saying here, or so you can see that what he's saying here is that even though his body was physically in the wilderness, his eyes of faith, his heart was focused on God, his presence, his glory, and, and his strength, right? And so in other words, instead of focusing on his current difficult circumstance in life, being in the wilderness and all that entailed, his eyes were laser focused on the ultimate prize. For example, I remember when LeBron James was back on the Cleveland Cavaliers and he was so determined on bringing back Cleveland its uh, first ever professional championship. And so one thing he would do every time the NBA playoffs would start was he'd go dark on all of his social media platforms. And so he wouldn't post anything, he wouldn't tweet anything during that time. So I remember someone was interviewing and asking him why he would do that. And he said he, he didn't want anyone or anything distracting him for what, for, from what his eyes were laser focused on in that moment. And it was, he was so determined and focused on winning Cleveland its first ever championship. And he actually ended up accomplishing that for them. And I think similarly for us, we need to keep our eyes on the ultimate prize that lies ahead of us, that we get in the end of this. And so our calling and our goal for this life right now is to keep our gaze on Jesus, to keep focus on him, because there's many things in this world, many things in this life that are going to try distracting us from him and try to take our focus off of him. But that's why the writer of Hebrews tells us in uh, chapter 12, verse 1 through 2, let us run with endurance the race that lies ahead of us, keeping our eyes on Jesus. And so regardless of the difficulties in life, regardless of the current circumstances you are facing, we are called to keep our eyes on Jesus, to stay focused on him because he is the ultimate prize that we get. And so a content life is a focused life. It's, a fo it's focused on Jesus and eternity regardless of what's currently happening in your life. So that's the first thing we see here. The second thing we see here is that a content life is a worshipful life. A content life is a worshipful life. Let's keep on reading. Look at verse 3 through 5. It says, My lips will glorify you because your faithful love is better than life. So I will bless you as long as I live. At your name, I will lift up my hands. You satisfy me as with rich food. My mouth will praise you with joyful lips. So the psalmist David is worshiping the Lord with his whole being here. But keep in mind the context here. 
despite all that's going on, like being betrayed by family and friends, being overthrown as king, and running for his life into the wilderness, he's still praising the Lord here. He's giving God all the glory, blessing, and praise in the wilderness. Do you know why? Because he's fully content in the Lord. Verse 5 says, is at the heart of this psalm, and it says, you satisfy me. You satisfy me. He's found his satisfaction in the Lord, and that's why he's praising him. Now, because he's a musician, I'm sure his praise and worship includes uh, musical worship like singing, right? But the Bible also describes that all of life is worship unto the Lord. And so a worshipful life means that everything we do in word and deed can glorify, honor, and praise the Lord as well, right? And so we worship God by being the best spouse, parent, by being the best doctor, lawyer, entrepreneur, counselor, or whatever career field you are in so that God gets the glory and honor and also so that people can come to know Jesus through that as well. So a content life is a worshipful life. Yes, we are involved in the corporate worship of the church on Sundays. Yes, but it's also where we seek to glorify and honor God in everything that we do every day of our lives. So that includes Monday through Saturday as well. And so content life is a worshipful life. But then the third thing we see here is that a content life is a meditative life. A content life is a meditative life. Let's keep on reading. Verse 6. It says, when I think of you as I lie on my bed, I meditate on you during the night watches. So the psalmist is meditating even in the midst of danger. Now, it's important for us to, uh, to understand what biblical meditation is. So for Buddhists, for example, uh, meditation is the act of emptying oneself. But in the Bible, it's not about emptying yourself. Meditation is about filling yourself up with something. And so in the Psalms, we see that David is, is meditating on certain things often. And so there's times where he's uh, meditating on God himself, the person of God, right? But then he also meditates on the Lord's redemptive works, his faithfulness in the past to David. But then also he meditates on God's word as well. And so it's important for us to, to fill ourselves up with these things because when we meditate on these things, it has the power to shape us how we view the world, and what we do in this life. And so let me ask you this, church. What are you filling yourself up with? What are you filling yourself up with? The answer can be found in what you spend the most time on or what occupies your mind and your thoughts throughout the day and at night because that thing can shape who you are. And so for David, instead of filling up his mind and heart with fear during the night watches, like looking out, like who's, who's looking after me? Who's about to come and get me? No, instead he's meditating on God. Instead of filling himself up with fear, he's filling himself up with God and his word and his faithful works throughout the ages. So for those who are content in the Lord, it's God, his word that fill them up and shape who they are. And so a content life is a meditative life. And the fourth thing we see here is that a content life is an intimate life. It is an intimate life. Look at verse 8. Let's keep on reading. It says, I follow close to you. Your right hand holds on to me. So here we see that David follows the Lord closely and he follows his lead. This is discipleship and spiritual formation language here. All right? Because this is what a disciple does. Back in the day, a disciple would follow their master, their teacher, their rabbi closely throughout the entire day. And the ESV, another version of the Bible, describes this act of following closely with one word. It says to cling. It's cling, right? It's that intimate, right? Well, now in modern times, the word cling or clingy is seen in the negative light, right? We don't ever want like a clingy partner or a clingy friend, right? I, I can't imagine meeting Leah 10 years ago and trying to impress her enough to go on a date with me and describing myself in this way. Nice to meet you, Leah. Let me, let me take you out on a date. But before, let me like, you know, like just describe myself a little bit. Uh, first, I'm Latino. Hola, como esta? You know, and she's like, ooh, check. I like that. Okay, okay. 
off on a good start, right? Muy caliente, right? And then secondly, you know, uh, I'm a musician. I tickle the ivories. She's like, whoo this is getting better. I like it. Check. Okay. And then finally, girl, I'm the clingiest guy you've ever met, right? She'd be done with me immediately, right? It's seen as a negative thing, but here in this psalm, being clingy is seen in a positive light, and it's how we are to follow the Lord. But maybe you're like, I'm not a clingy person at all. I'm not going to cling on to anything. That's not an option here for you spiritually. You're going to cling on to something whether you realize it or not. That's why the writer of Hebrews also says, uh, let us lay aside all weight and sin that what? Easily clings on to us. And so it's either God or sin that's going to cling to you. And the reason this is important is because you actually become what you cling on to. You actually become what you closely follow. And so when we follow the Lord, our master, Jesus Christ, our Savior, closely, by reading his word, by spending time in prayer, by meeting together with the saints in corporate worship, by going out and making disciples as he commanded us to, we are actually becoming more and more like Jesus. We become more and more like him. And we do the things that he does. This is what happens when we're disciples of Jesus, when we follow him closely, when we cling to him, when we abide in him as he commanded us to. Because that's where real life is found, in that type of intimacy with the Lord. And so a content life is an intimate life. As Jesus' disciples, we follow our master, our teacher, closely, right? We follow him closely. And so that's the fourth thing we see there. And, and he invites us to be clingy to him, right? That's the positive thing about it. Now, fifth thing we see here, fifth and final thing is that a content life is a joyful life. A content life is a joyful life. So let's keep on reading verse 7, and then we'll hop to verse 9 through 11. Look at verse 7. Because you are my helper, I will rejoice in the shadow of your wing. Verse 9 says, Those who intend to destroy my life will go into the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the power of the sword. They will become a meal for jackals. But the king, talking about himself, will rejoice in God. All who swear by him will boast, for the mouths of liars will be shut. Even though his life was in danger and the kingdom was in trouble, he didn't fear. Instead, he chose to rejoice in God. And he rejoices because he knows that God is his helper in his time of need. And he also rejoices because he knows that God is the righteous judge. And he's going to handle all of his enemies that seek to destroy him justly. So he doesn't have to fear. He rejoices in the Lord. And so how can anyone have this type of joy in the midst of danger and chaos? It's only found in the Lord. That's what this psalm is proving. That is only found in the Lord. And so a content life is a joyful life. We can have everlasting joy in God, regardless of our current circumstances that surround us. And that's the last thing we see here. But all five of these things is what the Lord promises to uh, those uh, who are in him. He promises this life to those who are in him. And so we can be content even in the wilderness of So as we come to a close today, I want to briefly recap everything we've seen so far. We've seen that our main idea is that since only God can uh, truly satisfy us, uh, we can have true contentment in this life. And so we've seen that even in the wilderness of life, we can truly be content. And Psalm 63 shows us that a content life is a focused life. It's a worshipful life. It's a meditative life. It is a intimate life, and it is a joyful life. And this is the life that everyone desires and everyone seeks after, but it can only be found in Christ. It can only be found in Christ. But here's the reality. The bad news is that because all human beings are sinful, it means that none of us can seek God. None of us want to seek God. God. Romans 3.11 says that there is no one who seeks God. There's no one. But this this desire that he's given us still remains. He created us with this longing for him. But instead of looking for him, we go to counterfeit gods to try and satisfy. 
But unless we find the one and only true God, our souls will never be truly satisfied. That's what makes the good news of the gospel good news. Because Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Jesus seeks us. Jesus seeks us. It's wonderful. It's an amazing thing that God seeks after us to have a relationship with us. And he invites everyone that's far away from him to have this life of contentment. And so my prayer is today, if you don't know Jesus, if Jesus is not your Lord today, that you would see your need for Jesus today and that only he can satisfy your greatest longings. Everything else will fail. He will satisfy. And so my prayer is that you would accept that offer. But for those who have already accepted his offer, of salvation and and are in a relationship with the Lord, we often need to be reminded that true contentment is found in the Lord because this can be a battle that we fight often in our minds and hearts, right? We, We often think that the grass is greener on the other side, right? Or we start buying into the lies of the world that if we only had a little bit more of this or a little bit more of that, we would find true contentment. And so what should we do when this happens? What should we do? Well, we should remember this truth, that what is secondary should always remain secondary. What is secondary should always remain secondary. Look at Romans 8.32 to see what I'm talking about. Romans 8.32 says, He, talking about God the Father, who did not spare his own son, Jesus Christ, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Now, when we hear all things, it's like everything I want, every, no, what it's saying here in context is that's secondary. That's secondary. See, as we said before, Jesus is all that we need to satisfy us. He's the primary thing we need to satisfy us and to be content in this life. And God, the father in his grace already gave us his son, Jesus Christ. He gave us the primary thing that we need to be content in this life. He didn't hold him back. It says he didn't spare him. And so why do we think like God is opposed to giving us other things, uh, secondary things? Why do we think he would hold out on those things? No. See, but the, the, the focus here is that everything else outside of Christ that you desire for satisfaction is secondary. So leave it there. Let it be secondary. Let it remain secondary. But our tendency is to elevate that above Jesus in our life. And he's saying, don't do that. Because when you do that, that becomes a counterfeit God that will fail you, that will disappoint you, and will turn into a bust. And you're just going to be in this continual cycle for satisfaction, looking for that. He says, no, you have everything you need in Christ. Church, if you have Christ, you have everything. You have everything. You have all that you need. So church, that is our God. Jesus is our God. And so may we reap the blessings that come with him being our God, and may our lives reflect the satisfaction that is only found in Jesus Christ himself. And so all that we got to do, all we should be doing, church, is joining along with David and saying, I eagerly seek you. Seek him. Yes, your heart, your soul is satisfied, but he's available and he's inexhaustible. And so keep on seeking him. Keep searching after him. Amen? And so that is the God that satisfies.